Welcome back to the History of Rock Music with Amy and Carl. And today we are doing the episode number four, dealing with the decade of the 70s. Now, I have listened to two pieces of music in preparation for this discussion with Carl. The first one was um, Sweet Home Alabama, and the second one was My Sharona. If you have not listened to my first listens of those, you should, I highly recommend that you pause right now, go check those out, and then come back because then this conversation will make a whole lot more sense to you. Um, having said that, welcome, and I hope you'll enjoy the discussion. Yeah, so you had a chance to listen to uh, rock legends Leonard Skinner. Um, Leonard Skinner is a very interesting band. They're actually from Florida, but even though they're from Florida, because they put out Sweet Home Alabama, most people assume that they were from Alabama, but they weren't. They were just singing about it. Now, um, putting them into a specific form of rock or any kind of music is not easy with this band because of the heavy blues element. They're known as blues rock mm -hmm. okay. because of the country, kind of country yeah, feel. Yeah, I picked that up. It's country rock. And then really what we, most of us see it as, is southern rock. Now, okay. if you remember, Amy, you and I had a conversation the other day about how when we hear composers... You have a good idea where they're from. We were talking about mm -hmm. Elgar and Handel from right, England. Right, right. Of course, the famous guys like Bach and people like that from between Austria and Germany. And the French and then yes. the Eastern Europe. And... and then you have the American composers like Copeland. Right. Um, this is a very similar kind of situation in that when you hear Southern rock, you know what it is. It's just, I know that. Okay. Um, and, and so when you were hearing the broken guitar part, or the, not the broken chording parts, but the ding, dun, da, 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 da. Yeah, it has a feel. Just the way they have uh, using their amplification uh, systems that they're using, they've got a specific sound that uh -huh. works for them, and it's very clean. It is. Even yeah. with the vocals. Mm -hmm. You can understand the vast majority of vocals, even though it's rock and roll, and sometimes the vocals get lost in things. No, this is very clean, the way that they're singing. Right. So it's a very interesting uh, form of music in that there's a lot of Southern rock that I like. Now, where it gets even a bit more complex is Southern rock, if I said to you, yeah, we're going to listen to a Southern rock song. Now that you've heard Leonard, Leonard Skinner, you might go, okay, I know what I should be expecting to hear. No, you don't but that's okay. And I, I use the example of a band called Pantera. Okay. Pantera is Southern metal. <laughs> so they're a, a, they're a Southern, that Southern feel. Vinnie Paul, their drummer, um, wears a cowboy hat. Um, they have that flair, but don't ever kid yourself. These guys are heavy metal players. Okay. Uh, another guy that comes to mind is Kid Rock. And Kid Rock, you know, when he plays some performances, he'll have the, uh, the battle flag the stars and bars behind him, um, and he's a rap artist and does rap music. Interesting, okay. So even though it's Southern, there's a lot of different styles within the Southern rock right, sub-genres right. uh, that we come up with. So very, very interesting form of music. Now, I want to take this chance right now to just quickly talk a bit about technology, um, and we're going to talk more about that, especially when we get into the 1980s. Um, but one of the big things, and I, I said to everyone I was going to bring something in, this, everybody, is a 45 record. Uh, now, most of you out there will have seen these. Uh, anyone who's over 35 will have probably played one of these. Um, this is a 45 record. This is what's responsible for making rock music what it is today. Uh, because the 45 okay. gives you the ability to put one song, in most cases, um, one song onto one side of the uh, record. It's made of vinyl, which is why it's black, but I'm going to get into a, a, another area of that in a couple of moments. Um, but it, it's made from vinyl. Um, depending on where you are on the planet, depends on the quality of the vinyl. Canadian vinyl and Japanese vinyl is considered the best vinyl, whereas American vinyl often has hair and oils in it that the other ones don't. Interesting. And I so, didn't know that. Yeah, and people will swear that they can hear the difference. I can't. Uh, my ears just aren't good enough anymore. I can't really hear the difference between a vinyl record made in the States and one made in okay. Japan. Um, although I used to actually have a collection of Japanese recordings. And you could tell them because they'd have Japanese writing down the mm -hmm. side. And it was on pure 
uh, virgin, like virgin rock, but uh, pure virgin vinyl. And you'd pay double the price for an album that was made with that. Interesting. So with the 45, what was so great about the 45 is when we compare it to the long playing record. This is a long playing record. This is a band called Super Tramp who I happen to very much enjoy. Uh, and we will be talking about Super Tramp on a later date. And when I take the album out, there's a 12 inch long playing record. So we have our 45, which is seven inches, and then we have a full size album. So what's the difference? Well, the album has um, numerous tracks on each side. Right. So you may have 10 tracks on a given album, depending on the type of music that the uh, band plays. Whereas again, with the 45, you'll have one track on one side, one track on the second side. Now, of course, because the album is bigger, uses more material and whatnot, the album generally costs you more when you, in my day, probably an album would set you back about $10. Okay. In, in that time. Mm -hmm. So when I bought this album, uh, Paris by Supertramp, it probably was, well, it was a double album set. So there were two albums to it. It probably set me back about $15 to buy the album. So I'm going to put that down. But the beauty of the 45 is the 45, when I was a kid, was a dollar. So ah, I had a choice between $15 <laughs> or $1. Now, what happened in the early stages of uh, music and rock and this is going to, trust me, just keep with me because this is going to lead into Leonard Skinner in a minute. The beauty of this is if you had an album out there, you might not like five of the tracks off the 10 track album, but you still had to pay for the 10 tracks. The beauty of the 45 is you could buy the song that you wanted. Right. Yes, you had a second side, which had a second song on it. You didn't care about the second side, although sometimes you would if the first side was not as good as the second side. Uh, but we, we used to buy uh, 45s because they were inexpensive and it could get us the music see, that we really enjoyed listening to. Um, so that's the idea behind the 45. Now, when you were a young teenager in the 50s or 60s, you were probably purchasing these because it was I good never value. purchased any. I, I guess I came along too late for that. But my parents, when I was a kid, had a record player. And of course, my grandma had a record player. So... I remember placing them on the turntable and setting the needle and yes. and then, but it was all classical sure, in my world. Sure, sure, so. of course. <laughs> and then the last thing I wanted to show the audience, this is an album I got autographed by the drummer of the band. Um, and the reason I bring this up is because this one's on green vinyl. So you'll see we've got a green vinyl I've album as well. I've never seen a green vinyl. Yeah, so it doesn't have to come in black. Mm -hmm. It can also come in different colors. And there are things called picture discs where you actually have pictures of the album that are actually on the album itself. I see. So there were a lot of different ways of approaching for sales purposes and stuff. The music Marketing. is still the same, mm -hmm. but isn't it cool? I've got a gold record from the Beatles and it plays on my record player. Now, why is this important? Well, with Leonard Skinner as an example with Sweet Home Alabama, what they used to often do was make two versions of their song, and Sweet Home Alabama was an example of that. Okay. So there was the radio version, and then there was the album version. So the radio versions tended to be shorter because they were on 45s, which don't hold as much information. So if you take a look at uh, Leonard Skinner's album, the version of Sweet Home Alabama that was on the radio version, which was on a 45, was about four minutes in length. Okay. The album version was five minutes in yes, length. Yes, I think I listened to the album version because I think it was five minutes. Okay. And, and the thing is, is when you go to the album version, one minute may not sound like a much, a very much, but in this case, that's 20% addition. Right. And it used to frustrate me when I was younger listening to music when I would hear songs that I really loved that I had the albums for. And then I'd hear them on the radio and they were chopped chop short. And often they cut out the part that I liked the most of the song in order to make it fit on the radio format. So this is where technology starts to come into play. And I didn't get into 78 records because 78 records, they were kind of out of fashion by the time the rock and roll genre started to come really heavily into play. So let's now talk a bit about Sweet Home Alabama itself and Leonard Skinner, the band. Leonard, Leonard Skinner, the band, is a tragedy. Um, unfortunately, um, the band had been together only for a short period of time when they lost three of their members in a plane crash. Oh, wow. Yes, but they still managed to make a significant impact on the music industry. Now, Sweet Home Alabama itself, 
I really like the song and it's always been a difficult one for me to come to terms with. Should bands be political or should they not? They've got a huge market audience that they can talk to. If they do the music really well, I think it can be very powerful. If they don't do it so well, it can be very misleading and uh, misinformative. And we see that even today, especially with yeah. social media and what goes on in today's day and age. This particular song, when you start to read the lyrics, the actual song was almost a protest to a song, a couple of songs, written by a Canadian artist, Neil Young. Okay. Now, when we go back after we've finished our quick tear through mm -hmm. of all of this, yeah. we're going to go back in detail and Neil Young is going to come up all along right. with the bands that he played in because he was a significant force. And in Canada, he still is a significant force in the music industry. Anyway, he wrote two songs. One of them is called Alabama. The second one was called um, Southern Man. Okay. And they're not the most complimentary to the South. I assume being Canadian, it's he's going to have a different view of what's happening in the South. Very much so. Those down in the South. Yes, and um, a lot of the lyrical content was based around racism and right. other things, which I'm not saying Canada is not a racist country. We have racism just like every country does, but it's not quite as overt as right, what right. you see in the United States. Like we never had colored drinking fountains and white people. There was no segregation yeah. here. And this is the time in the early 70s, we were finally coming to terms with the civil rights movement and that, look, we're all humans here. Why don't we mm -hmm. treat, treat each other accordingly? Okay. Mm -hmm. So when Neil Young puts out a song, which is kind of putting down uh, Southern values and norms, of course, it's going to get a reaction. And Leonard Skinner gave that reaction through Sweet Home Alabama. Okay, and if okay, you okay. notice in uh -huh. the lyrics, I don't know if you notice it. Um, we hope Neil will remember a Southern man don't need him around anyhow. And they actually named Neil Young in the song, which is very unusual to do because you're marking out someone by name at that point. Yes, wow. lawsuits can ensue and other things. However, what a lot of the public that was listening to the song didn't understand was these musicians had great respect for each other. And I'll get more into that in just a moment. But even again in the song, they talk, talk about... Um, they loved their governor, boo, 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 and we all did what we could do. That was about uh, uh, Wallace. Right. And he was very much a segregationist. I, I you know. You know, segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. Um, and so, unfortunately, because they put that into the music, it now sounds as though they support him. And Leonard Skinner, uh, from my readings about the band... Didn't really support, uh, didn't support Wallace in his view. Okay, okay. But what they were trying to point out was that Southerners are very different. Some Southerners yes. look at the world this way. Others look at it this way. Totally fair. Totally true. <laughs> exactly. But what was happening was the listeners were reading it the way they wanted to. So again, if you were from the North, you might listen to it one way. And if you listen from a Southern perspective, you may hear it a different way. And again, even in the lyrics, they, they talk about um, Watergate. Does Watergate bother, uh, bother you? Tell me true. Um, and the hypocrisy of the North in that we can judge you in the South, but we got problems too. So be very careful uh, of what you say about people. So, as this went on, the media, of course, because they love to make problems where there aren't any, started saying, well, there's these issues between Neil Young and Leonard Skinner, but there never was. And in fact, I see. Neil Young or um, Leonard Skinner, um, th their singer, used to wear a Neil Young t shirt on stage. Neil Young had a Leonard Skinner, it was a bottle of Jack Daniels on his t-shirt, but it was from Leonard Skinner. These people really respected each other, but the, Interesting. the fan base didn't really understand this. Mm -hmm. And it comes up to, this is something that's very important to understand with rock music. Musicians, because of their artistic nature, need to express themselves. And rock is really big into that. And if you remember when we were talking way back when about rock music, that lyrics are incredibly important. Right. And they're often controversial. Right. And they raise problems because, right. no, we're going to say what we honestly believe. 
This is one of those examples where that came forward. So there was this mythical animosity between the organizations, which was never there. And in fact, when the three members of Leonard Skinner died, at the very next concert, Neil Young sang Alabama, and then right after it, he did a cover of Sweet Home Alabama. Wow. And then he never played Alabama ever again in any of his concerts. Hmm. So this respect that we have for right, each other right. as musicians goes beyond what a lot of the public realizes. Um, and even as late as the past couple of years, uh, the final member of uh, Leonard Skinner, who's still alive, made the comment that it was the song wasn't against Neil Young. It was about the song he wrote. And I think we can all learn a tremendous amount from that in that don't attack a person. If you don't like what they've said or done, attack what they've said or done, not right, the person. Right. And uh, I think, if anything, even though um, Sweet Home Alabama is such a well-known song, it's bringing forward a, a different message that I think people are missing out on. The final part I wanted to quickly bring up to you about Sweet Home Alabama is the idea of the hook. Okay. And it goes on and on and on and on. Which is very common for Leonard Skinner. They like to repeat things. But if you like that riff that they're playing, they've got you hooked. I see. You're going to sing that again and again. And in the future, Amy, I'm telling you, if you ever hear, you're going to go, hey, you may not even remember it was Leonard Skinner that you heard from, but you'll immediately know what that song is. Okay. Or if you hear other bands that use similar styles, you're going to say, that reminds me of so-and-so and so-and-so. And bands like Leonard Skinner influenced other bands that would come after them. In their case, especially in the country rock and southern rock genres, Makes they sense. were highly influential in what they were doing. So I admire the band. I respect the band. I can't say as I'm a fan, uh, but I do love the song Sweet Home Alabama, and I played it in God knows how many <laughs> bands I've been in, and I always enjoy playing it mm -hmm. because of the simplicity of the song, Right. but also there's a strong message. And this is a dichotomy you're going to see again and again in the rock genre where you may have a tune where it's repetitive, maybe even boring to you, but the words are very significant and vice versa, where you'll have a tune that can be quite complex and engaging and pulls you in, but the lyrics are, quite frankly, they're nonsense, but that's okay because that's the way that we uh, approach the music. So on what I've just told you, what questions I, are... I was just going to say that... One of the things that I noticed about that song was how there were so many different musical references and, and pulling from different styles. But at the same time, I appreciate how direct the music sounds. Yeah. And it took me a few minutes. It was after I did my first listen before I put it all together and, and was able to articulate. It's the directness that is quite satisfying in that mm -hmm. piece of music because... You have all these different strands coming into it, and then it ends up being not a mishmash or a toss salad, but something that is very solid and well placed in its own direct setup. Agreed. Uh, to me, I see it as clean. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. getting straight to the point, which is one of the fundamentals of being a rock musician is get your point. Um, I know that you and I have discussed this in the past where I've talked about rock being the modern day minstrels mm -hmm. and that you're telling stories, but you've got three to four minutes to tell that story. You better get it out there right away and let people know what it is. And even with the 45 example that I was using earlier is, guys, you got four minutes, get it out. And She Loves You, a very short song. Yes, it's because there wasn't a lot necessarily to say in that song but it wasn't the purpose of the song. It was to get people's attention. It was to get people dancing and moving as we've already discussed. Mm -hmm. Leonard Skinner, in their particular case, grab you with a hook right away. That yeah. draws you in 
And now let's give them the message that we're trying to convey here. And they do it incredibly effectively. And they that's do. what I admire about them. When you listen to this song, mm -hmm. and then we go back and we listen to Shaboom Shaboom, or we listen to Rock Around the Clock, um, or the 60s songs that we listen to, The Boxer, for instance, do you feel or see a semblance of movement in a direction, or do you see how things are progressing in a given direction, either musically, um, compositionally, or just the sound of the band? Is there anything that sticks out to you at this point? And if there isn't, it's fine, because it's going to, I promise you, over the next couple of right. uh, meetings that we have. But is there anything that stands out at this point for you? I guess... It's very obvious that the music is changing. Um, I don't know if I can quite say that I think it's moving forward yep. for it up to this point, or is it simply just evolving? Sure. Um, representing or, or becoming something different. Move, moving forward to me is, is kind of a tricky term to classify what do we mean by moving forward Agreed. is it is it developing in a certain direction if so what is that direction and i i guess i don't have a solid sense of direction right at this song but it's obviously changing i can say sure definitely everything up to this point is very different yeah uh, and uh, then and then of course i've listened to the other one for this episode as well um uh the Mac. yes and that one also is very different right so i don't know if i can say that it is moving forward into that or if that is simply a new something that has grown out of it and it's changing but I don't know yet if we're leaving this behind or if it's, if it's splitting or if it's, yeah. I, I think the best, uh, the best word that you used was evolution. Yeah. It's evolving. You've got this core. Right. And it's now starting to branch out into all of these different right. areas. Because, because the boxer. Yes. Um, that one doesn't really feel like, it doesn't feel like this Sweet Home Alabama is a progression forwards from right. the boxer. It feels more like it's something new, it's something different, perhaps a branch, perhaps um, an evolution, but I can't say that it sounds like we've moved forward musically right. from the boxer. So, But like what you said, what is forward? Right, exactly. I, I don't know what forward is. Right. No, it's just different. It's different. And, and it yeah. appeals to different people for different reasons. Yeah. But what I love about all of this is that it still has those core elements that came right back from the 1930s when we were listening to the jazz and the right. blues. Right, and I am it's getting still that there. sense. Uh -huh. It's still there, even though it's morphed into this thing that you're going, wow, that doesn't sound like anything I've heard before. But I can still hear the origins. And that's why it was so important that we do this quick overview. Right, right. Because when we get into things in detail, and now you'll then start to make even more relationships and right. go, okay, I see how we got here. Um, as opposed to, oh my God, it, it's changing dramatically. Yeah, it is And I also have some reference point about where it might be going because when we get into the details, I will have heard a bit of the future as well. Exactly. Moving into My Sharona, which was the other one that I listened to, um, there were a couple of things that I picked up on that one. One was the, the very systematic entry, which, okay, the other songs that I've listened to there's been layering and, and stuff like that, but this sounded so, so systematically organized in the way they set it up. From the drums, to the bass, to the guitar, to the voice. I, I actually was able to predict that it was the voice coming next, even though I, I knew nothing about the song. And then, of course, the rhythmic element, which carried through not just the drums or the bass, but all all members of the band all parts including the voice mm -hmm. um i guess i guess that's the most rhythmic use of vocals that i've heard up to this point 
in in this journey. And I'm curious about that a bit. Too. Sure. Okay, um, we're getting into a very turbulent time on the music industry here. Um, we had gone through the classic rock phase which and the progressive rock phase, which was the early 70s. We haven't listened to any of that yet. That's coming later when we dive into things more deeply. We had disco during the 1970s. We had punk rock during the 70s. And all of a sudden, this new sound started to come out, which we called New Wave. Arguably, the Knack came out with one of the earlier, what we call New Wave uh, songs. New and, Wave. And where did that new wave term is it just because it was a new style coming yes. in okay yep. and new wave which came out of punk rock okay. but also had huge influences from the 1960s okay this clean sound the drive back to that not happy but very groove oriented yep. that you've identified um so when the knack came out with this whether it was conscious on part on the part of the band or it just felt good the way they were do doing it by putting the drums up first and allowing them to play is now the hook okay. like we look with uh -huh. leonard skinnard so right. you still got a hook there but now it's not with the guitar and melodic it's now rhythmic it's a rhythmic hook because you've got that hook and you've drawn the person, you want to hold them there for the three minutes you're going to play or the four minutes you're going to play the song for. This song is a cl classic version of that. Now, you also hit on something very important from a rock musician's perspective. I am a rock musician, although I play other forms of music, and I'm a drummer. And as a drummer, I look to the bass guitarist. Now, what I mean, and here we get into the education portion of how rock music goes together. When we're composing songs as rock musicians, generally, this is a principle okay. I'm getting into uh -huh. now, the bass and the drums will set up the rhythm section. I see. So it's not just the drummer that's doing it. Mm -hmm. The bass is going to do it with them, which is why... It. I've heard that in a few of the pieces. I've, I've picked it up in a few of the pieces that I've listened to over the past few months. Certainly. I don't know if I could specify which one, but I remember there was somewhere I, I, I commented and I said, there's, there's a dynamism between the percussion and the bass. You bet. And here's, and some of your viewers may have experienced this before where you hear a song and you think it's the bass drum playing, but it's the bass guitar playing or vice versa. You think it's the bass guitar playing, but it's the mm -hmm. drummer that's playing. Now, what, what's happening here is on the drum set. And for those of you who haven't seen it, go to this link and check out the presentation I did on drum set. The bass drum is critical in rock music. I argue it's the most important part of the drum set in music. And because I think the drums are the most important part in rock music, it is the most important part of the instrument of okay. the music entirely. The bass player will generally play their notes based on what the bass drum is doing. I see, I see. The two of them lock together, which now becomes greater than the sum of the two parts. Mm -hmm. You get this... Oh my God, there's the groove. I can okay, hear okay, it. Right. The guitarist, which can also go along with those, but does it always. You now throw that on top. Now you got the ba da 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 dun 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 da da. It's mimicking the drum set. Yes. It's mimicking the bass, bass yes. guitar. Now you got the guitar. And as you've already pointed out, when the vocals come in, they're mimicking all of it as well. Exactly, exactly. It's a very, it feels very vertical to me. Where, it is. Where everything is. is is focused this way as as how they mesh and stuff. It is. Very yeah. cohesive. Mm -hmm. Now, do you remember, you and I had a conversation a few days ago. I was talking about how I'm not a great jazz player mm -hmm. and that I'm a rock yeah, player. Yeah, I remember you mentioned And how I've spent years, I've spent literally years and years listening to a metronome, trying to get my playing exactly on beat. Whereas with a jazz player, no, I'm afforded this opportunity to move. And when we look at blues, you call it squishy. Squishy. There, there's room for maneuver. Rock music, generally, there is not room for maneuver. Okay. And um, it's this effect. I remember when I did, when I played on the harp, a little excerpt from, I guess it was Bohemian Rhapsody. Okay. And I put it out on the channel just, you know, for fun. And... Somebody commented and said, I don't like all this romantic interpretation of it. Can't you at least try to make it sound like rock? <laughs> well, 
I'm a harpist and this piece is very has a lot of classical influence so of course that's what I picked up on but it yeah. was so interesting to hear back from someone saying I don't like what you did right I don't like what you did it's it's too too fluid too yeah. flexible it's not open to interpretation here yeah. no you're going to play what's being required now what becomes interesting so now we've got this bo bo da da boom da boom da going on the bass drum is driving it the bass is copying it to pull things in but then they make a counterpoint to it using the snare drums and in the snare drum they use something called a flam which is why i have my snare drum and a pair of sticks here because some of your audience may not know what a flam is a flam is called a rudiment um, and a rudiment as the name implies is a fundamental that we use as drummers used heavily in classical particularly march music and what it does is it fattens out the sound and so this is what a flam is check this out what you've got is you've got one stick coming down and the second one comes in right after it right so it's not together it's it's fattened the sound and let me take the snares off there that is very important especially for a song like this when because the bass drum even though it's slight it has a more legato sound than a snare drum which is that real crack short sound mm -hmm. by doing a flam it's now counterbalancing the bass drum but it's still got more of a legato sound because it's longer see, see, and therefore right. by doing the two of them they complement each other really well even though one is high pitched in a crack the other one's low uh low sounding now you could look at that and say yeah well the bass is, bass guitar is doing what the drum bass drum is doing the bass guitar has a legato is lengthening sound. lengthening the sound. The guitar right. will tend, because it's more trebly, will tend to sound shorter and get lost in the music. Well, the snare is now complementing the guitarist at the same time. So what the drummer is doing and what all really good rock drummers do, they hold the band together by what they're playing on the instrument. Unlike in classical music where you have multiple of different instrument right, instrumentalists right, right. with the conductor who's holding them together, in rock music, it's your drummer that's holding that position down. Okay. And you'll get arguments out of guitars. No, that's not really what it is. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm here to tell you. It is the way it is. <laughs> the drummer is the foundation I'm for sure, it. I'm sure you guitarists also have a very critical part you in the You better believe the they do. So... Could you imagine going to a dance I'm... and it was only a drummer all night? Oh boy, that sounds exciting and thrilling. So yes, it, it, it certainly doesn't take away anything from the guitarist, the bass player. But this yeah, is... but it's it's the it's the collaborative element where each one has something to contribute. It is now, and that's why I love small ensemble playing. Sure. Personally, as a classical musician, I love being in a small group. Not. Okay, a full orchestra is fine where we have to follow a conductor and all of that. But when we are in a small group, two, three, four, five of us, each with our own instrument or our own part to contribute, there's no one instrument that is in charge of the entire thing. Yep. Each one of us has something to contribute to that. And I guess I, guess I feel like rock bands are kind of like that. They are. So the drum is contributing one part of it, the guitar another, and, and it's all feeding into the, to the whole balance. Certainly, you've made a really excellent observation. The, in my opinion, the quintessential rock band is the power trio. Okay. Bands like Rush, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, The Police, um, all of these bands had three members in it. And think of it very much like a stool, a three-legged stool. Mm -hmm. You pull one of those legs out, the whole thing collapses. And it's the same with this. As, as a musician in a power trio, and I played in power trios and just love it, what ends up happening is you are playing a really important role to fill out that music. And if for some reason you either make a mistake or things get lost or they're not working, the whole thing collapses in it. And it has a certain amount of stress it places upon you to make sure that I'm dead on. Now, yeah. That goes back to what we were just talking about, about this verticalness. Mm -hmm. It's dead on time. I'm staying on time. Especially with power trios, that is a critical element, which is why I'm a poor jazz player. 
I have difficulty with the big groups where there's stuff going on all over. Yeah, but where are we driving this whole thing? Well, don't worry, see, Carl, see, just relax. Right? But I can't. I want to know where that beat is and where the downbeat is. Um, and it brings up the idea of the backbeat, where the bass drum is playing on your forward beat, your one and your threes generally. And the snare drum almost always is playing on two and four, okay. the backbeat. And it's that crack of the backbeat. And that's where everyone claps. So for those of us that are musicians, there's nothing worse going to, especially a rock concert, when someone is clapping on one and three and not two and four. Oh, there's a great little video clip on YouTube, which okay. I've seen, of a pianist giving a, a performance. I don't remember. Was it a jazz performance or something anyway? And the audience was all clapping on one and three. And it's brutal. And it was brilliant what he did. He threw in one, one bar yeah. of five four. Yes, and it brought and, everyone back and on. And suddenly everybody was where he wanted them to be. And it's just a it's a fun one to watch. I'll have to see if I can find it for well, you. Well, of course, the corollary to that is as a professional drummer, I will sometimes go to things and clap on one and three just to be just the to drive everyone nerd crazy. or the. The, the horrible person at the show, just to show, it, it, it's like fingers on a chalkboard. It's, it doesn't feel right. I, I once read a, a, a snippet where it said, friends don't let friends clap on one and three. And it's so true. But anyway, getting back, getting back to what we're talking about here with My Sharona. My Sharona was the start of this new wave, both meta okay. metaphorically and literally of this new form and style of music, which is pulling back from the 1960s. Um, My Sharona at the time was the fastest uh, song to move up the charts that there had been since 1964 when the Beatles put out, I Want to Hold Your Hand. Wow, something's coming here. Something is okay. triggered and uh -huh. connected with the audience whereby this band comes out of nowhere. Their very first song off their very first album and it catches everyone. And I will The first being the first, that's impressive to me. Yeah, it, it, certainly. And, and, and the thing about it is, is the way the music is constructed and it's what you brought up. It's that simplicity of that hook of the ba da 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 dun 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 And I remember, because I was 16 when the song came out, I remember all my friends. As soon as someone cracked into that, everyone knew what it was that you were talking about yeah. because it has that catchy feel to it. Much like with Leonard Skinnerd, dun dun da da dun dun da da right, You right, immediately right, right. know what it is. And that is one of the hallmarks of rock music is that as soon as you hear it, you know what it is. Uh, the all there used to be a show I don't know if you remember it called Name That Tune. I can name that tune in X number of notes. I see, I see. If you had to do this with this, and I can name that in one note, there's no questions. You know, that bat. Hey, that's got to be my Sharona. So it's very interesting that it had a lot of technical elements to it, which relate back to the 1960s music. But it's a very fresh sound, even though. It's rehashing what's been done right, before, right, right. which is going to be this underlying thing that you and I are going to go through again and again and again of, yes, they went back to this period and pulled this music forward. Which makes perfect sense because really anything new, it's not really going to be new because yeah. there are only so many ways you can arrange and rearrange and set up. And if you're trying to do something completely new and groundbreaking, you basically have to go out of the realm of musicality. Right. So it's more about new ways of, of using the tools that we have available to us sure. musically. And perhaps applying it in a, in a new way, in a different way, balancing it differently, um, setting it up differently. But, but it's all music. So yep. we've had music for so many thousands of years it's going to have been heard somewhere. Sure. You know, just like um, some of the pieces I've listened to on the channel, I've referenced all the way back to modal, modal styles sure. from, from the Middle Ages, just because, yeah, it's not the first time it came up. Right. It cycles through over and over and over again. And, and it makes sense because if it worked on our ancestors, it's likely going to work on us. Most probably so. You know, once something's established and you like it, 
when it comes back around again, yeah. And you see that even in today's music, like I'm talking about 2020, of certain bands that are coming back and they're doing songs and those of us who are older, it's, yeah, I, I know exactly where that's coming from. But the younger generation doesn't necessarily know it. When they and hear so it, it they sounds go, fresh to their ears. That's cool. Yeah. Where did that come from? Okay, let me play a Beatles album <laughs> or let me play your Rolling Stones album. And all of a sudden it starts to make sense. And that's why I also think that it's really, really great for us to be familiar with the history of the music. Agreed. Because if we're going to create something, at least as, as far as a musician, myself, if I'm going to create something, it should not be merely copying something already done. But at the same time, the more I know and the more I have in my in my awareness of what has existed and how it's been done, the more effectively I can take all of that and put it together in my own way yes. for my own purposes and for the purpose, for the benefit of the audience that exists in front of me today. Mm -hmm. and, and again, you, you touch on a really good point. Um, there's a gentleman by the name of Greg Bissonette. He's one. Of, he's in my top five drummers of all time. I, I just love Greg Bissonette. He He's one of the nicest people you'll ever meet. In fact, I just saw him at Pasek that okay. we just had that we that I went to. And for those of you who don't know, Pasek is the Percussive Arts Society International Conference that I was at. And unfortunately, Amy was not able to make it down there uh, when I was there, or up there in your case, because you were going north. We wanted to meet. I was then. going south. Um, but yeah, uh, Greg Bissonette was there, and Greg Bissonette once told me in a I was in a class that he was uh, doing, and he said that. Great or good drummers um, will listen to other music, but it's the great drummers that steal the music. And he doesn't mean that we should all go out there and steal other people's music, but it's the influences. It's the, yes, this is really good. I'm going to take this, but I'm now going to make it mine. And if you can develop in a, in a way that is meaningful, yep. then it's not simply just rehashing no. or reinventing the wheel. Certainly. And the danger of not knowing what came before is to think you've done something incredibly new and to find you've done a mediocre job of something that was great yeah, some to begin decades with. ago. Certainly. And so with my Sharona, we were getting into a new area and a new form of playing, which I've already said is new wave. Now, new wave in its own right is this huge, huge area of music as well, which we will talk about in the future. Now, the last thing I wanted to talk about my Sharona mm -hmm. is something called stutter rock. Um, there's a host of bands. The Who was really famous for doing it about, uh, talking about my generation, which is a song that's on my list for okay. you. And, um, Roger Daltrey, the singer of the band does t -t 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 talking about my generation. I see, I see, I and see. it wasn't a, an affront to someone who has a stutter. No, it just worked in that environment. Another band that did that and did really, really well was a Canadian band called Backman Turner Overdrive. And they did a song called you ain't seen nothing yet. And it's, you ain't seen n -n -n nothing yet. And it's funny because, and we'll get into those songs later, but the band hated the song because of the stuttering. But it works really well. It gives a rhythmic element. It does. To the voice. It also builds tension. Yes. D d d d okay, where are we going with this? Yeah. And so subtly it's building that tension and then it releases when the uh -huh. person says, and you know, you and I both know in all music, especially classical, it's that release and build. You have to build. build the tension and then release it. Exactly. And, and it's so satisfying yeah. when it ends. There's nothing worse than if you were to play a song and not end on the same chord that you started the song with because as you're starting to resolve the song and you don't resolve it, that's treasonous. You can't do that. But some why guys do. we end do. up here? <laughs> yeah. And some people do end up doing that and it's effective. But normally, especially in yeah. popular music, that's not an effective way of doing it. So in this particular song by The Knack, you hear the m -m 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 my Sharona. Now, it's not stuttering in the traditional sense. It's more of a repeating of the word. Yeah. But it, it still falls under the stuttering style okay. where you're doing these multiple words one I after see. another right. before you actually get to what the, the actual resolution was. Now, in a lyrical sense, of course, m -m -m my Sharona. If you're a young 17 or 18 year old guy or girl who really is attracted to someone in the, uh, uh, from the other sex, what often happens is we get tongue tied. Uh -huh, uh -huh, yeah. This 
and I'm not saying this was conscious on their part, but this emulates that innocence right, right. that's going on. So at the risk of sounding too academic here, there's a lot going on in something like this, even something as simple as da 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 no, there's more to it than that. And once you understand that these things are going on, some of them intentional, some of them non-intentional, it can breathe new life or interest into something that might be considered right, boring. Right, right, right. Now, it's great because you've got Leonard Skinner. If you ever hear that riff, you're going to know it right away. You've now got My Sharona. Both of them have tremendous hooks to them. And this is going to come up in the future and you're going to go, yeah, I like that hook. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank I'll you. Pass it back to you. <laughs> I will see you all next time. Next thing coming up is going to be my two first listens, which Carla's going to assign me for the next episode. And I'll be putting those out this week. Watch for them. Listen to them. Tell us what you think. And we're eager to have your feedback. And then, of course, in about a week's time or so, you'll get to see the next time we sit down together and talk and explore all this wonderful music and development. So I've enjoyed this. Thank you. And I'll see you soon. <laughs>